start by opening the regression shrinkage notebook. This lesson introduces some important methods from scikit-learn. In particular, we'll take a look at ridge regression, lasso, and the preferred method available from scikit-learn to standardize data, which is a necessary step when estimating models using shrinkage. We'll start by importing NumPy and Pandas with their usual canonical names. We're also going to import the two shrinkage estimators, Lasso and Ridge Regression, from Scikit-Learn. We import these from SKLearn Linear Model, and the two we're going to import are Lasso CV and Ridge CV. These are especially convenient functions because not only do they estimate the parameters using the Lasso or Ridge Regression, they also implement cross-validation in a convenient-to-use package. Exercise 50 asks us to use the same data that we used on the previous problem. To understand the steps here that are used to import the data, please refer to the previous solution. We'll start by standardizing the data. Standardization is important when working with shrinkage estimators to ensure that shrinkage parameters, in particular penalty parameters, are applied in a uniform way across columns that may have very different scales. Since we're working with return data here, there probably isn't a huge variance in the difference of the scales of the data, that is, the variances of the returns themselves, but they won't be the same. And so if we use a single tuning parameter in our shrinkage estimator, we'd find that we'd ultimately be penalizing different regressors differently. The solution is to standardize your data, especially the X data, although we'll standardize everything here, to ensure that we're penalizing one standard deviation changes equally, rather than penalizing each variable in its own units separately. The standardization itself is fairly simple. We're first going to compute the x scale and the y scale as the standard deviation. The one thing you notice here is we've set ddof equal to 0. This is the degree of freedom parameter. Sometimes standard deviations use n minus 1. That's the default in pandas. Here, by setting ddof equal to 0, we're essentially saying use n to divide things by rather than n minus 1. This is done for compatibility with scikit-learn, so in practice it won't make much difference if you use ddof equals 0 or ddof equals 1, which is the default. Once you've computed the standard deviations, we can standardize the data by dividing each by the scale factors. So in other words, the standard x is just x divided by x scale, the standard y is just y divided by y scale. We'll use these throughout the remainder of the problem, except when we want to return to the original data to compare regressors across different implementations. Exercise 51 asks us to take a look at the lasso and to calibrate the tuning parameter, which is called alpha in scikit-learn, but which we called lambda in the lectures. We start by initializing the lasso CV model. The only option we're going to pass is fit intercept equals false. This tells scikit-learn that we want a model without an intercept, which is important since we're performing portfolio tracking. The first step in training a model is to fit the model parameters. Here, we fit the model parameters using standard x and standard y. The arguments to scikit-learn are always the x variable followed by the y variable. The great thing about Lasso CV is this does all the work for us. Not only does it estimate the model parameters, it also performs a cross-validation search using k-fold cross-validation to find the parameter that provides the best model fit. We can see the value of this parameter by accessing the alpha underscore attribute of a trained model. Note that if we tried to access this before we trained the model with data, this attribute would not exist. We can also see the coefficients using the coef underscore attribute, which contains the coefficients that have been estimated using the optimized alpha. In exercise 52, we look at the process that's needed to convert the coefficients we estimate using lasso estimated on standardized data 
back to the scale of the original data. Recall that regressions are closed to affine transformations, and the transformation that we made to the x and the y, where we rescaled them both to have unit standard deviation, is in this class of affine transformations. Since we divided y by y scale, and we divided x by x scale, we're going to need to scale the coefficients by y scale divided by x scale. In order to understand this transformation, imagine we hadn't scaled the x's, just the y. Since we divided the y by its y scale, what we need to do to undo that transformation is to multiply the coefficients by the y scale to return both y and the coefficients to the original scale of the data. Similarly, since we divided x by x scale, the coefficients will naturally scale up by x scale compared to the original coefficients. And so what we need to do there is we need to divide the coefficients by x scale. Multiplying by the factor y scale divided by x scale is exactly the rescaling that's needed to standardize the coefficients to be comparable to coefficients estimated on the original scale of the data. We can take a look at these coefficients, and we see that we mostly have positive coefficients. Some of them are relatively large. For example, business equipment has a coefficient of 0 0.2. These are portfolio weights, which suggests that business equipment plays an important role in the determinant, at least with respect to its own standard deviation. Similarly, we can see that money and other also have relatively large coefficients. In exercise 53, we take a look at the steps that are needed to calibrate the tuning parameter in a ridge regression using cross-validation. We initialize the model using the same argument, fit intercept equals false, to ensure that the model doesn't have an intercept. Ridge CV needs to be initialized with a second parameter, which is a list of alphas that it should use when cross-validation. This additional parameter is needed in Ridge CV since it isn't the case, as it was with Lasso, that the entire path of regression coefficients for all possible values of alpha can be easily computed. Instead, in Ridge CV, we pass a list of alphas to try. The list here is simply lin space 1 100 with 100 steps. What this is going to do is simply going to be the values 1, 2, 3, all the way through 100. The idea here is to try values across a grid and what we'll do in the next step is we'll actually refine this once we find a reasonable estimate of the range where alpha may lie. Note that it may be the case that you need to try different ranges here. If you try a range and you find that the optimal alpha ends up at the end of the range, in this example it would be either 1 or 100, then you'll need to try values outside that range until you find a set of values that will bracket the alpha. We estimate the model in the same way by calling fit with the standardized x and the standardized y. And we can take a look at the optimal alpha using the alpha attribute. Here we see that the optimized alpha is around 5, which suggests that we should try values near 5. In particular, it should be somewhere between 4 and 6. In the next iteration, we use the same command, except now we use a much finer alpha grid between 4 and 6 with 2,001 points. It isn't really necessary to use such a fine grid. Probably 100 or a couple hundred points would be enough. But in practice, Ridge CV is extremely quick to estimate with the optimized implementation in scikit-learn. We fit the model again. And finally, we look at the optimized value of alpha. We see that this value is 4.87, so fairly close to 5. But we now should have this value accurate to a few decimal places. We can also take a look at the coefficients. We see the coefficients are fairly similar. We've lost the variable names that we had at the end of the lasso regression, but it would be simple enough to add these back by wrapping this in a pandas series and setting the index equal to the column names. In exercise 54, we're asked to convert the coefficients we got from the ridge regression back to the scale of the original data. The transformation is identical to what we used before, and so we just multiply by y scale divided by x scale. Now we can see the coefficients in their original scale are very similar to the coefficients we got from Lasso. In particular, business equipment also has a weight of around 
and money and other also have relatively large weights of about 14% and 11.5%. In exercise 55, we compare the coefficients we've estimated using lasso and ridge regression to those we'd find if we were to use OLS. In order to compare coefficients, we need to estimate the coefficients we'd get if we were to estimate them with OLS, which of course is a special case of lasso or ridge regression when the penalty parameter takes a value zero. We'll use stats models OLS to estimate the parameters. This is similar to what we've seen in previous lessons. We'll then plot the data together. To simplify plotting the data, we'll take our three sets of parameters, OLS, LASSO, which have been transformed back to the original scale of the data, and RIDGE, which have also been transformed back to the original scale of the data, and combine them into a single data frame. We'll then call plot on this data frame using a bar plot, and we'll pass it an axis that we've created. We only created the axis so we can easily set the figure size so that it will look good in the notebook. It isn't really necessary to do this, and you could leave out the ax equals ax argument. We can see from the figure that the coefficients are very similar. And in fact, the OLS, the lasso, and the ridge have similar values. We see that in general, lasso tends to have slightly smaller values for each coefficient. Ridge is a bit of more of a mixed story that it's smaller for some coefficients, it's larger for others. We do know that in both cases, the penalty is binding. Since the optimized alpha parameters, which act as a penalty on the OLS objective function, were non-zero, which suggests that the solution will be something different from OLS, and in particular, for the case of lasso, the L1 sum of the coefficients will be less than the L1 sum from OLS, or in the case of ridge, the L2 sum of the coefficients, that is the sum of the coefficients squared, will be smaller than what you get from OLS. In practice, these coefficients are small in magnitude. The easiest way to see that is that the coefficients are similar. But nonetheless, there is some shrinkage, and these are different estimates. And so ultimately, it would be an empirical question which works better, the OLS estimates or one of the set of the parameters that were estimated using shrinkage. In exercise 56, we'll take a look at how we can use scikit-learn's scalars to scale the data. This will be particularly convenient later because we'll be able to then use the same scalar to transform the data back to the original scale without needing to manually convert it ourselves. We're going to start by importing standard scalar from sklearn preprocessing. This is the main scalar, and it uses the same transformation that we used above, that is, by default, it will recenter values by subtracting the mean, and then standardize by an estimate of the standard deviation that is computed by dividing by n rather than, say, n minus 1. The one thing we need to change from the default configuration is we need to set with mean equal to false. This is needed in our particular application because we don't want to recenter the values to have zero means because we're trying to track the entire portfolio return of the left-hand side variable. Usually, if a model includes an intercept, it would be normal to recenter the data to be with mean equals true, which is the default configuration. But in the case of estimating a model that excludes the intercept, you'll want to have with mean equals false so that we actually are forcing the intercept to be zero and we're not moving around the returns used in the tracking portfolio. Once we've initialized the scalar, we simply call it by fitting it. This is similar to training a model, but in this case, we're training the scalar. This is a necessary step because the scalar needs to know the mean and the standard deviation of the data. This will allow these values to be applied to the same data set, but they'll also allow us to apply them to other data sets later. So once we've initialized Yscaler, we repeat the same steps for Xscaler. We initialize it with mean equals false, and then we call it by fitting it to the x values. Finally, in order to get our standard data, that is STDY and STDX, we simply call our scalars, yscaler, xscaler, with the method transform, where we transform y and x. One thing you'll notice here is I created the variable y2d as a data frame. y originally was a series. 
Scalar likes to operate only on 2D arrays, and so it's simplest to wrap the series in a data frame so that it becomes a data frame with a single column. We can repeat the exercise we used earlier for Ridge CV using the standardized X and the standardized Y that we created using scikit-learns method. And we can see immediately that the optimized value of alpha is exactly the same, which is a very strong hint that we've done the same thing here, only using the machinery of scikit-learn. In exercise 57, we take a look at how we can use the scalar that we previously initialized to construct out of stable predictions that have the same scale as the original data. We'll start by calling the predict method. In this case, we use the ridge model that we previously trained. And so we predict it using the standardized x data. Since we standardize both x and y, this prediction will be a prediction for the standardized y data. The y scaler was originally used to rescale the y data to be standardized y data. It has another method called inverse transform that can be used to inverse this transformation. However, we wouldn't want to transform and then inverse transform the y. Instead, we want to call inverse transform on the predictions. What this will do is this will take the predictions, which are predictions for the standardized y, and map them back into a rescaled prediction space that has the same scale as the original y. Finally, we can take a look at these rescaled predictions. In exercise 58, we extend this to produce out-of-sample forecasts for the two shrinkage estimators. We'll also construct out-of-sample forecasts for OLS. And finally, we'll evaluate the out-of-sample SSE for both methods. We'll start by getting the out-of-sample data, that is, Y out-of-sample is just the original evaluated market data from 2015 until the end of the sample. X out of sample is the original industry portfolio returns, also from 2015 until the end of the sample. And then finally, we'll construct our standardized X out of sample. Here we'll use the X scalar and its transform method, but instead of calling it with the original X data, we now call it with the out of sample X data. This applies the same transformation that we previously used to standardize the in sample data to the out of sample data. And so the out of sample data has the same scale as the data we used in sample. This means we can make predictions from the out of sample data as if it was in sample data, at least as far as the scale is concerned. We'll call the predict method on the standardized out of sample data. This produces a set of standardized predictions, that is predictions for the standardized values of y. We, of course, don't want predictions for the standardized value of y. We want predictions for the original values of y, that is, the original out-of-sample y. And so to get that, we're going to use the y scalar again and its inverse transform method, or we call that on the predictions. y scalar in transform of pred is going to transform the predictions to have the same scale as the original y data. We construct the out-of-sample residuals as the original y data out of sample minus the rescaled predictions. And then we get the out of sample sum of squared errors simply as the inner product of the residuals. You can see the value there is 19.1. You might recall from the notebook on best subset regression that the preferred model we found there had an out of sample SSE of about 22. And so this seems to be a relatively large improvement. In best subset regression, we chose a model with nine variables. This model, of course, has access to all 12 variables, although it applies shrinkage, and so the coefficients are not directly comparable. Next, we repeat the same steps, this time for the ridge model. We start by making a prediction using the standardized out of sample data. We then use inverse transform on the predictions to construct predictions with the same scale as the original y data. We then construct the residuals as y out of sample minus these rescaled predictions. And finally, we construct the out of sample sum of squared errors. We'll take a look at that. The value of 19.5 is slightly larger than what we found previously, although it's still smaller than what we saw when we used best subset regression.
The one thing that may be slightly surprising here is the use of NP squeeze. This is used to squeeze our predictions from two dimensions to one dimension. We need this here because the ridge regression code prefers to work exclusively in two dimensions, and so it outputs a two dimensional prediction. Y out of sample is a 1D series, and so in order to construct the residuals, we need to subtract a 1D series from the 1D series. We do this by squeezing the prediction array, which has the number of out of sample observations by one column, to simply be a one dimensional array, which we then can use to construct the residuals. Finally, we directly compute the out of sample predictions simply by multiplying the out of sample x data, of course not scaled here, by the OLS coefficients that we previously estimated. The out of sample residuals are simply the y out of sample data minus the out of sample predictions. And finally, we can construct the out of sample sum of squared errors. We see this value is 20.1, which is also better than the best subset regression, but importantly, it's worse than the performance of both ridge and lasso. This is usually expected, and it's generally the case that shrinkage methods will outperform OLS when it comes to prediction, simply because it's almost always the case that we want to introduce a little bit of bias. The small amount of bias has a relatively small impact on the out of sample sum of squared errors, but it usually has a relatively large impact on the variance component of the out of sample sum of squared errors, since sum of squared errors includes both the squared bias and the variance. Biased estimators like Lasso or Ridge formalize this process and allow us to introduce bias in a disciplined manner. Exercise 59 asks us to repeat the previous exercise, only this time doing things directly. Again, we start by the out of sample x data, and now we're going to simply multiply that by the coefficients that have been previously transformed to be in the same scale as the original data. So in other words, our direct prediction is the out of sample x's multiplied matrix multiplication here by the ridge regression coefficients rescaled into the same space of the original x and the original y that we previously constructed. The remaining three steps are the same. We construct the residuals as the out of sample y minus the direct prediction, compute the sum of squared errors, and we can see here that the value is exactly the same. This, of course, proves that we've done this. The advantage of using the scikit-learn methods are that they provide a disciplined way to do this across a wide range of transformations and models, including linear regression, ridge regression, lasso, but also methods such as regression trees.